Hello, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Alberto Hernandez. I'm the new, well, two-year-old uh, chief librarian and archivist at the Center for Puerto Rican Studies. Uh, I welcome you in the name of the Library Archives and, of course, of Centro. Uh, we're very happy to have you. Uh, we have a very distinguished uh, group of ladies sitting just at that table. Um, we have Carmen Dolores Hernandez, who's going to be a moderator. She flew from Puerto Rico to be here with us. We have Maria Dominguez, <laughs> Nisa Tufino, and Ms. Eva de la O. Uh, tonight's event, uh, it's part of a... a uh, centers uh, outreach and, and activities that we want to uh, have your input. We want to meet you face to face. We have the feedback on things you like, things you don't like that much, and, and how can we improve our services. Uh, we are on tonight. We have a partnership with uh, the Permente Soto Vélez Cultural Center in the, and Emmanuel Moran and Body Mix and the uh, Society for Educational Arts. And tonight is our second big collaboration. Last year I worked with Miguel Treyes, if you know Miguel, he's an artist, graphic artist. We work on an exhibition on Clemente Soto Vélez. And this year we're working on something on Pura del Pre. And that will be held, you know, do the announcement? Okay. Well, uh, no more to say, the Executive Director of Body Mix and uh, Society for Educational Arts, Ma Dr. Manuel Moran. Gracias, Alberto. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Manuel Moran. I'm the executive producer of Body Mix Puerto Rico Fest uh, 2010, and this is our fifth year celebrating uh, this festival to highlighting Puerto Rican arts and culture. And today is our first event, so we have to applaud for that. <laughs> We have a full month of, of events, uh, 22 events during the month of November. Um, I urge everybody to take one of these El Diario uh, inserts where you find a calendar and all the information of all the events. We have a film series that starts tomorrow at Baru College. Uh, every Wednesday we're going to be uh, presenting a Puerto Rican films at Baruch College, and also we are very fortunate to have the U.S. premiere of one of uh, the newest, one of the newest Puerto Rican films, uh, Luis Caballero's El Color de la Guayaba, which opens on, on the 19th at Baruch College as well. We're also collaborating with El Centro in many different events. Um, obviously, today is uh, one of those events. Tonight is one of those events. Um, we have theater, we have music, uh, we have a wonderful art exhibit uh, that is opening this Friday at the Clemente Soto Vélez Cultural uh, Center on the Lower East Side, and it's happening at 6 o'clock, and it's a big, big celebration. We have a party every year. This year we're going to have Los Pleneros de la 21 with us. Roms of Puerto Rico are sponsoring our, um, a, our reception. And two beautiful exhibits. One is uh, put together by Alberto Vanucci and El Centro, um, and also the other one um, uh, curated by our actually our, our assistant producer of the festival and one of the co-creators of Body Mix, Miguel Treyes. Um, I want to also urge everybody to come and celebrate um, our heritage and our through the, through the arts um, during this month. Uh, there's events in the Bronx, there's events here in Manhattan, in Brooklyn, all over the city, so please join us, take a calendar, and there's a, a mailing list out there. If you're not part of our mailing list, please join and get, share your, your email list so we can keep you informed. I want to take the opportunity before presenting um, the moderator of the evening uh, to thank my staff. Uh, I have a couple of people here uh, that have put together this festival, starting with our manager, Richard Marino, who's over there. Thank, thank you, Richard, and Ingrid uh, Echevarria, she's um, the office manager of SEA, and then a group of people who have put together this festival working for a full year to plan these uh, 22 events. And of course, uh, Miguel, who have been fantastic helping us, and thank you, thank you all of you. Uh, we're very excited and uh, because we were able to, uh, to bring Carmen Dolores uh, to New York. Uh, it's always a pleasure to to share with her and, and to be with her. And uh, she's going to be the moder moderator of the to tonight's panel. Um, Dr. Carmen Dolores Hernandez, obviously, is from Puerto Rico. And I highlight a couple of things of her extensive bio. Um, she finished high school in Ponce, I have to say. She's, so <laughs> her childhood was in Ponce. Um, she, get, she, gets, she has a bachelor's degree from uh, Sagrado Corazon, Sacred Heart College in San Juan and Manhattanville College in Purchase, uh, New York. She also studied at NYU in Spain, um, 
and she got her PhD at the University of Puerto Rico, where she specialized in Spanish poetry of the 20th century. Uh, she taught at the University of Puerto Rico and has been writing for uh, the Puerto Rican newspaper El Nuevo Día since 1981. There she has interviewed Mar Mario Vargas Llosa, Juan Luis Tisolo, Carlos Fuentes, Derez Walcott, William Kennedy, and many others. Her books include uh, Manuel Alto Aguirre, Vida y Literatura in 1974, De Aquí y De Allá, Libros de Puerto Rico y del Extranjero, 1984, Puerto Rican Voices in English, Interview with Writers, 1997, uh, Entrevistas a Escritores Puertorriqueños, uh, 2008, Ricardo Alegría, Una Vida, in 2002, and her latest book, um, eh, Convocados, eh, in 2009. So let's welcome Dr. Carmen Dolores Hernández. I'm just going to give a short introduction here to the uh, round table, the rectangular table discussion. <laughs> uh, I am very honored and happy to be here with you tonight. As a journalist who has lived all her professional life in Puerto Rico and has had close contacts with writers, artists, and cultural figures, I am well aware of the generalized perception of New York City as the world center for all the arts, literature, the visual arts, theater, cinema, and music, something which it certainly is. The dynamics of a center versus the periphery is always present in island endeavors. To stay or to leave is the perennial question in Puerto Rico, and the conundrum is even expressed in a humorous saying, which would you rather be, a lion's tail or a mouse's head? The women in this panel do not have to answer that hypothetical question because they have all made it here in New York City. Neither did they have to leave a homeland to get to where they are because in at least the ca two case, uh, the cases of Nitsa Tufino, this is the place where they were born. Or I think you were born in Puerto Rico, right? But you Mexico. Mexico, okay. <laughs> And in all cases, this is where they have lived. Okay. Body mix. Body mix. <laughs> in all cases, this is where they have lived the greater part of their lives and where they have become artists. It's not a question of becoming an artist in Puerto Rico and seeing if they can make it here in New York. They became artists here in New York. Their success is all the more spectacular because unlike island Puerto Ricans' expectations, this center for the, art, for the arts, which is New York City, presents formidable challenges, not the least of which are the odds stacked by the force of sheer numbers against aspiring artists, especially though against those coming from outside. And this outside I, does not refer to another place, but a race, gender, or ethnic origin which is not the central one from which artists and writers have traditionally come from, which is the great white male tradition of creativity. So there is a center within a center, and this is what these three exceptional women have had to deal with. The way they have done so will be the subject of this interchange. From where did they come in terms of cultural advantages? What did they want to achieve? How did they go about their art to achieve it? What obstacles did they overcome and where did these obstacles spring from? Did they come from within or from outside the Puerto Rican community? When and how did they feel that they were doing what they wanted to and obtaining a response for it? What was their relation to the city? What did the city give them and what did it take away? What is it about their art that has made a difference in the city? How does it appear in their writing and or their art or their music? How have they related to specific cultural institutions like the Museo del Barrio, the Centro de Estudio Puerto Riqueño, Taller Boricua, Hunter College, and any others which may have empowered them? How have they tried to establish ties with Puerto Rico and to what extent have those ties 
serve to nourish their art. Has that contact been widened to include other Latinos, other national, ethnic, and cultural groups that are present in the city? What relation does their art, their music, or their literature have with black culture? What is their perception in some of the way the artist's vision has transformed New York into the vibrant, multicultural, multilingual, multi-ethnic center it has become today more than ever for the world? It is this vision, which they have expressed in the different art, artists' endeavors, which has contributed to make the Puerto Ricans in the city not only a sociological phenomenon, but a cultural force to be reckoned with. These are some of the themes that come to mind when I sit beside these notable women whose art has made a difference in the city inserting into it a Puerto Rican consciousness, the same as Pura Belpre did when she created an awareness of the creativity and diversity of Puerto Rican children's literature with her research and her recuperation of folk tales which were previously unknown here. Allow me then to introduce them, I will introduce them all now, and then uh, we, we will hear what we came here to hear, which is their words. Maria Dominguez, a native of Puerto Rico, is a widely exhibited artist who was commissioned in 2002 by New York City's Metropolitan Transportation Authority to create 16 paintings and transform them into dazzling stained glass windows. L Views, a permanent installation for Chauncey Street Station along with the Jay-Z Lines in Brooklyn, received the Excellence in Design Award by the New York Municipal Society in 2004. In 2005, along with Art Makers Inc., an artist collective, she completed When Women Pursue Justice, a 3,300-foot mural in Brooklyn. In 2006, Brooklyn Connect commissioned Awake, Arise, Move, a mural also located in Brooklyn. And in 2007, she made Bronx Allegory for Gun Hill Community Health Center in the Bronx. In 2008, she created Alegria Nocturna for Barrio Restaurant in Brooklyn. Most recently, she was included in On the Wall, Four Decades of Community Murals in New York City, a photographic exhibition organized in conjunction with the publication of Images of the African Diaspora. Her solo exhibits includes her solo exhibits include the ones she has, she has held at Brooklyn College, WBGO Art Gallery in Brooklyn, GOBA Gallery in Newark, Boricua College, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College, and at the Brooklyn Central Library. She has received grants from the National Endowment for the Arts and the New York Foundation for the Arts. She has headed El Museo del Barrio's Museum Education Department and is currently a teaching artist throughout the New York City school system. Soprano Eva de la O is a versatile artist who has won praise for her performances in opera, musical theater, oratorio, and concerts. Backstage music critic Jay Shulman described her performances as Abigail in Verdi's Nabucco as, and I quote, a voice that seemed unbelievable, something out of the golden age of opera, when flawless tonal beauty was uppermost rather than fake glamour and high-pressure publicity campaigns. Ms. De Lao made her operatic debut in Ghent, Belgium, and was present in Spain's Santiago de Compostela Music Festival by the late Argentine composer Alberto Ginastera. She was presented in, in Spain's Santiago de Compostela Music Festival by the late Argentinian composer Alberto Ginastera. A graduate of the Juilliard School of Music, Ms. De La O also trained with the renowned vocal coach Maestro Arthur Leaf and with Alberta Maciello of the Metropolitan Opera. A soprano well known for her vocal technique, Ms. De La O teaches the art of bel canto in her studio in New York City and is coordinator of vocal studies in the music department at Lehman College City University of New York. Eva De La O is founder director of the Musica de Cámara Chamber Music Concert Series which is celebrating its 30th anniversary this season. Musica de Camera concerts have provided a forum in which Puerto Rican and Hispanic instrumentalists, singers, and composers can present their work. 
Upwards of 200 concerts have included non-Hispanic artists as well. In addition to concerts at Alice Tully Hall, Lincoln Center, the Merkin Concert Hall, the Tillis Center for the Performing Arts, Wheel Hall, Carnegie Hall, Symphony Space, and the Lehman Center for the Performing Arts, Musica de Camera also presents concerts and its lecture demonstration masterclass program at schools, colleges, and community centers, churches, and museums. Nita Tufino, firstborn child of one of Puerto Rico's most renowned artists of the 20th century, Rafael Tufino, inherited his and her Mexican mother's artistic genes. A muralist and printmaker who is interested in public arts, an interest which reflects the influence of her teacher, David Alfaro Siqueiros, her first public mural was made for the facade of then community-based El Museo del Barrio, of which she is a founder as an artist art activist. Her interventions as muralist and public artist in New York have included her works for the two subway train stations within the Metropolitan Transit Authority, the Health and Hospitals Corporation, both from New York, <coughs> La Guardia Community College in New York, Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, and the Hospital for Special Care in New Britain, Connecticut. As resident artist teaching art and design at the Central Connecticut State University, she developed and created the first murals public art program at that university. In the 70s, Nitsa Tufino was recognized as El Taller Boricua's first female artist, and she has been involved with El Taller since that time. She has received numerous awards during her four decades as an artist, including the Donald G. Sullivan Award from the Department of Urban Planning, Hunter College, the Mid-Atlantic Endowment for the Arts Regional Award from the Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation, the New York Foundation for the Arts Artist Fellowship, the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund for Outstanding Contribution to the Arts Award in conjunction with Major David Dinkins of New York, New York City Council's Excellence in Arts Award given by Council President Andrew Stein, and the Manhattan Borough President's Excellence and Outstanding Achievement Award given by Manhattan Borough President Ruth Messenger. I want to excuse from this round table discussion Nicola writer Nicolas Amor, who um, who couldn't be here with us. She has, uh, she was suddenly taken ill. And I want to pay a tribute to her because she was the, one of the principal writers whom I interviewed for my book in 1997 because her book, A Woman's Portfolio, Rituals of Survival, really moved me to understand how New York or stateside Puerto Ricans are really the same as us island-wide Puerto Ricans. So I leave with you uh, first Maria Dominguez, then Eva de la O, and last but not least, Nitsa Tufini. Thank you. Um, I was going to do a presentation from my website, but I think uh, uh, for those of you that uh, got my work downstairs, and uh, in the context that it's in, it's the 1980s, 1990s. It was old work that paved my way to where I'm at now. Um, that work that uh, you were able to see downstairs was work inspired by a, a, a community in flux. It was a community that um, I said a little word uh, downstairs about it was, uh, we had no housing, uh, drugs were rampant, um, the only thing we had at the time, and my earliest influences, were the New Yorkian Poets Movement, and the music, and the arts. Uh, at the time, uh, I joined a group called City Arts, which um, gracefully, after competing with uh, 100 other artists, I was awarded the commission, and I did by Le Bomba. And, and with that mural, I wanted to make a statement, because gentrification was just running right through us. Um, and for those that are going like this, you're probably from the Lower East Side and probably from East Harlem and the Bronx, because I think all of us were going through the same uh, sickness, which was uh, being eradicated. And um, uh, my baile bomba was made to make a statement and to actually say, we're here. And so bouncing out of that artwork, I think I went on to do uh, the piece that uh, 
La Plaza Cultural, which was um, La Lucha Continua, with uh, a group that I was part of initiating, which again, um, if you have time to go downstairs and see, and see the pieces, you'll see that they're bombshells, there's no apartments. Uh, uh, the only thing that was left, again, was that culture, that thriving culture of music in the streets, uh, el coco que habla, eh, uh, the poets in the streets, uh, New Rican poets, cafe, and that's where I got my earliest inspiration, where I was able to make a connection to who I was and, and to who my people were. Um, all, I came here when I was four, and all I knew is I came from Puerto Rico, and they put me in school, and I started learning American history, and I was there. Uh, so the only way I could step back to uh, who I was was joining these groups. Uh, I, I'm grateful for Charas, who was uh, the only group that was doing arts and culture and, and uh, applied for me, uh, for me to get a NISCA grant, which I did. And luckily I had a, not a friend, I didn't even know her, somebody there named Nick Satufino, who advocated strongly for me and I was able to get my first NISCA grant. And there I did, through Charas, uh, we did a series of murals, which was um, uh, La Lucha Continua, there was uh, um, uh, Trip to Fantasyland, which was children in the community. Uh, we did on the facade of, um, of El Boillo, we did a series of about six murals, where at, there it just stemmed and it made me affirm myself to who I was and who I am and what my job was. And my job was to, of course, inspire myself, the Latinos, the Boricuas that were there, and for them to realize that I was there. I was there to, um, to inspire, to uh, motivate, and to do the arts. Um, I guess I, I, what I'm really trying to say is that my earliest inspiration was more grassroots, more uh, 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 from, the, from the boots right on up, uh, pulling up your own straps because there was not much in 1983 in the Lower East Side except drugs, running from the gunshots, and trying to find a place to live. And um, I'm happy to say that it was uh, my, my perseverance to uh, continue this work to, uh, and now that is uh, uh, being a touring show, to get the word out that we were there, we were there, you know? Uh, nobody was writing the stories, but um, thank God I held on to all this work that it's, and now we're able to write those stories and able to say uh, what we've done and what we continue to undoing because um, after 15 years of applying to the MTA, uh, continuously, 15 continuous years, um, thank God again, uh, wonderful little angels uh, advocated for me and, and gave me the jewel of crown and I got the, the beautiful Chauncey Street project which um, it's, it's lovely and at some point, maybe at another time, I think my first show here uh, through Vidal, is he here? Who said, you know, why don't we present uh, this show, which was a Chauncey Street project and it was very elegantly lovely. It's a traveling show as well. And maybe at another time when we meet again, you'll be able to see it. So my earliest influence was my community, the housing movement, the uh, the anti-poverty movement, we were just, we had nothing and we had to make sticks, make brushes out of sticks. And thank God, I'm here. And I'm, I'm glad you're here to come and support me. If you have any questions, save them for later. And I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. very uh, moving moment for me because when I was eight years old and I went to PS 101 which still exists on East 111th Street in El Barrio. I was born in El Barrio by the way. In El Barrio Barrio. <laughs> and um, I have through my entire life been very privileged because I have always been able to have a very clear picture of my cultural and emotional uh, backbone. Like Pirador Salmia, my backbone is Puerto Rican. And I've never, ever, ever questioned that 
or been in doubt about that. My, identi my identity is very clear. As I said, I was born in El Barrio. I have had the privilege of having two parents who were graduates of the University of Puerto Rico. My father's best friend was Juan Antonio Correjer, whom I met when I was a little girl. That tells you how old I am. <laughs> and when my father introduced me to him on 109th Street and Fifth Avenue, he bent over and took my hand and said, tanto gusto, señorita. <laughs> Many years later, after he came out of jail, he was now a socialist, and he, because he had initially been a nationalist, he gave a ponencia, a, a presentation in El Museo del Barrio, and I said, I've got to go and see him now that I'm older and, and he's older. And I went there, and there were some young men with black berets guarding him before, the, before the, his presentation. And he said, and the young man said to me, Usted no puede entrar ahora, el maestro está descansando. You can't come in, the master is resting. What is your name? Yo me llamo Eva de la O. Usted no puede entrar, and from where the man was sitting, he said, ven a mis brazos, que tú eres la hija de mi hermano. Come to my arms, you are the daughter of my brother. Never forgot my father, never forgot me. As a, as a result, I, I was able to, to be close to him and speak to him. Um, another person, when I was eight, I, went, I was taken to a library on 110th Street, which is still there in El Barrio. And who was there talking about books? Pura bebre. Let me describe to you what this woman was to me. In my, my mind, I still see her. She was a woman in a black crepe dress with heels and beautiful stockings and long pearls down to here. And she spoke like my mother and father with an accent. It was wonderful because she was directing all her knowledge to us children and we felt like blown up. We were so proud. I am privileged because I, I lived in El Barrio. I met Canario of the Plena. He used to come to my house. I met Rafael Hernandez, who was a very good friend of my father's. You know? I remember Vito Marcantonio. I remember when he spoke on 106th Street, right in front of St. Cecilia's Church. And I remember when they, land, they launched a candidate against him who was Ita of Italian uh, descent who was totally defeated. I moved to Puerto Rico when I was, um, I was in music and art high school, that's another story. I mean, there's so many stories I should write a book. I mean, in junior high school, my principal, I tried for music and art high school, which is now the High School of Performing Arts, and the principal said to me, Josephine, what are you so worried about? That's my legal name, Josephine. They never called me that at home, it's always Eva. And what are you worried about, about the test for music and art? You're Puerto Rican, that's a, an academic high school. You're not gonna go to college. My mother was hysterical. She put on her hat. She missed a day of work at the factory. She worked in the factory, by the way. She didn't know how to hold a needle when she started working in a factory and she learned very staunch union member. And it wasn't until the Second World War when she became a translator. You know, they used to open up letters and she became a translator because she was fluent in both Spanish and Portuguese. And uh, she went to school to challenge this principal. Why are you talking to my daughter like that? Well, you know, you Puerto Ricans don't go to college. My mother said, I'm a graduate of the University of Puerto Rico. <laughs> the man wanted to die. Um, do you talk like that to all your students? He didn't know what to say. I mean, then I went to Puerto Rico, and when I went to Puerto Rico, I was La Americana, <laughs> which was like terrible. Um, I learned a lot about being in Puerto Rico as well. Because, I mean, my life, as you say, my life continued. I was Puerto Rican here, I'm Puerto Rican wherever I go. I went to, uh, I lived in Miami for three years, and my daughter at the time was four, and she went to a school where, the, where the, one of the teachers said, Ay, tu eres otra cubanita. And my daughter said, No, yo soy una puertorriqueñita. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, this, there's a, I can say a lot about my, my background, about my training at the Juilliard School, about my, 
my career as a singer, which was interrupted many times with two marriages and three children, and I was always, 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 always interested in the political end of life. I couldn't keep out of it. I just couldn't be a diva. It just wasn't, it wasn't true to who I am, you know? In, in, uh, uh, in more liberal uh, uh, parlance, I am a working artist. I will always be a working artist. I was lucky when I went to Puerto Rico to be able to study with the Figueroa family, famous Figueroas. I had studied with one of them here, piano, with Narciso. And I went to study voice with Alicia Morales, who was their cousin, who was the last accompanist of the famous Puerto Rican tenor, Antonio Paoli. And that's where I got my first clue of vocal technique. I got the scholarship to come to the Juilliard School that I applied for a scholarship. I filled out all the papers. And my mother reads in El Mundo, which still existed at the time, that they handed out 10 scholarships. And my mother said, how can they hand out scholarships? They didn't call you for an audition. And she says to me, mira, nena, tú te vas al Capitolio ahora. And I said, where is it? Tú eres a Guagua, tú te vas en el Capitolio. And you talk to this particular senator who's in charge of these things. I went. I was maybe 15. And I waited outside until he finally came out and I explained to him that I came from New York and I was a Puerto Rican and I expected to be auditioned. And that caused the biggest scandal. All of a sudden they started calling people back. They did audition and I was one of the two people who got the scholarship to come to Juilliard. I come to Juilliard and they tell me, oh, we can't accept you. We took the applications in March. You're coming here in September. I registered at Manhattan School of Music. I called my mother, mommy, no te preocupe, don't worry, because I registered at Manhattan School of Music. I didn't send you over there to go to Manhattan School of Music. I sent you to go to the Juilliard School. Espérame que voy para allá. She took a plane and she came here. She went to the Juilliard School and she said, it's not my daughter's fault that I come from an island that has a corrupt government. <laughs> they either thought she was nuts or um, the dean convened a group of people. They said, well, can she sing tomorrow? She can sing now, she's standing outside. <laughs> no, no, tomorrow at 10 o'clock and she's gotta do this and this and this and this and this. And I did and I got in. But my mother. <laughs> My mother was an extraordinary woman who later on worked in the Fuentes Fluviales in Puerto Rico and used to give exams to people. They, they were first lining the island with electrical lines, you know? And she used to get people, fathers of families that weren't employed, who would mess up in the entrance exam of math or, or English and she changed their grade <laughs> just to give them a job. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm a singer and I think I should sing. Yeah. I, I have a chamber music concert series. We just did a concert at the Metropolitan Museum of Art with 28 members, uh, string members, it's a string orchestra. I brought in uh, Rosaline Pavon, who has for 30 years been directing the, the um, Puerto Rico Symphony Orchestra. And they were brilliant. And the critic that reviewed it called me, I want some information. I said, anything you want, I mean, where are those musicians from? They're, they're from the New York area. No, where are they really from? <laughs> I said, well, they're from Venezuela, Korea, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Panama, Mexico, the United States, there are several African American Americans from here in the orchestra. Oh, I see, so it's like a United Nations. They were brilliant and they were wonderful. I was told that during one of the meetings they heard a tape of a concert we had done at St. Patrick's Cathedral and one of the people that heard the tape said, but if there if it, but if it's a Hispanic organization, why are they doing Bach, and why are they doing Ralph Vaughan Williams, and why are they doing Dvorak? <laughs> because we're classical musicians who happen to be Hispanic or Puerto Rican, huh? 
we have a long tradition of classical music, and classical music it gets left out of all of our events. It's a good party. There should be a big representation here of classical music. You know, it's not just that we own our heritage and our legado, as we have, what was we say in Spanish? It's that these are jobs. If they look upon us as if we don't belong in the field, they look upon us like freaks. You know, like we're not, in, we're not capable. We just can't, I mean, you can't cut a Bach double violin concerto, can you, honey? You know? Uh, and that, and that is, is, is terrible. That is terrible. We are everything. I have studied ethnomusicology at this college. I never finished my master's. I love ethnomusicology because I think the ethnic life of every composer is represented in every composer. And I'm talking about Bach, Mendelssohn, Brahms, Schubert, Schumann, Campos Parsi, Rafael Hernandez, I mean, whoever. What you are shows up in your music. And classical music is not different. It shows up in the music. Enough talk, a song. This is, esto es aquí sin ensayar ni nada, This is called, um, well, it's a song by Rafael Hernandez. Las blancas azucenas, los nardos y las rosas, mi alma muy triste y pesarosa, a las flores quiere ocultar su amargo dolor. Yo no quiero que la Los martirios que me da la vida, si supieran lo que estoy sufriendo de la pena, morirían también. Silencio. Los nardos y las azucenas No quiero que sepan mis penas Porque si viven llorando morirán Silencio que está Los nardos y las azucenas No quiero que sepan mis penas Porque si me ven llorando morirán by George Gershwin, it's called Summertime.
en México fue un accidente. <risa> mi mamá era mexicana, mi papá estaba estudiando en San Carlos y se conocieron, ella era modelo. Y él, ellos se conocieron porque ella, él le tocó ir a la clase de dibujo, ella era la modelo. Y él, 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 él a veces un día no quería dibujar y mi papá, mi mamá le dijo, oye, pero ¿qué te pasa que no dibuja? Y entonces decía, ay, que usted se mueve mucho. Y yo, yo no me muevo mucho, es que aquí hay muchos terremotos, porque yo vengo, ¿entiendes? Entonces de ahí empezaron a conocerse y, a, y, a, y de ahí salí yo, nací, naciendo allá. Se vinieron después a, a vivir a, a los Estados Unidos y después se fueron a Puerto Rico. Y ahí en Puerto Rico, bueno... Eh, mi papá pues tuvo, eh, como si hacía su carrera en México, si la hacía en los Estados Unidos, pero él siempre pensó que quería hacer su carrera y que lo conocieran desde su patria a Puerto Rico, aunque él era de Brooklyn, del Navy Yard, eh, nacido de, de madre puertorriqueña y de padre puertorriqueño y eso, pero muy bonitas historias que siempre me contaba de, de, de los clubs que habían en, en Manhattan y todo eso, y mi abuela trabajando gollita, trabajando en la factoría haciendo lámparas, bregando durante la guerra y todo eso. Entonces, a los 10 años se fue para Puerto Rico y de ahí él decidió nomás regresar a los Estados Unidos, se hizo totalmente boricua. So, mi vida, por un lado, eh, ¿cómo, le, ¿cómo digo? Porque mi papá amaba mucho a las mujeres, tuvo varias esposas, tuvo muchos hijos y yo fui la ma yo soy la mayor de todos esos hijos. Eh, so yo este, fui muy afortunada porque yo me crié durante los 50 en Puerto Rico, que era el tiempo de la división educación de la comunidad, Divetco. And in, Vi a mi padre hacer el primer mural, que fue el mural de, de, de La Plena. Y estoy hablando en español, estoy en español. Me emocioné tanto y tanto con la canción de, de, de Eva, porque también me recordó mucho a mi abuela, que a mi abuela le, canta, le, le encantaba esa canción. Entonces, cuando limpiaba la casa en, allá en San José, que nosotros vivíamos, pues ella, ella cantaba esa canción, ¿entiendes? Que esa era, eso me, me dejó como hablando en español, olvídate del inglés. Estás otra vez en Puerto Rico, que eso es, soy New York, Boricua, esto. Que hablo inglés, español, francés, olvídate, jeringosa, ¿entiendes? Y de ahí viene ese mejunga, el mix ese para hacer el trabajo. Entonces, pues durante Divesco, pues, pues fue un momento bien interesante en Puerto Rico porque fue donde se unificaron todas las, 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 las artes en Puerto Rico de cine, eh, writing, este, film, este, lo que no había era música, aunque estaba el centro de arte, que era otro, uh, another group that the artists have formed, con Torres Martino, Lorenzo Mar y eso. So I am a product of mingling around with all those guys. You know what I mean? Not only those, but if you know Nilita Vientos from el Ateneo Puerto Riqueño, you know, there I was also. So I was always listening to lectures, going to concerts, doing and watching other people do film or being part of the film. Go over here, sit over here, do this, let's take her over there. You know what I mean? So when the vet got started, they used to do a lot of community organizing. 
And uh, that was through Munoz Marin, which I happened to also meet and meet uh, uh, his family and all of that. So I was a kid always involved, you know, uh, with the artists and, and, and in that movement. So I was looking at a lot of things, how, how they did things. So it was kind of very exciting. So I guess through all my years, even when I was a teenager, um, I was also like so involved in it and also I was sort of like traveling to the States like in the Guagua area I would come here being El Barrio because I had a lot of family in El Barrio in 107 and 106 so you know traveling back and forth back and forth and then also traveling back and forth from Mexico uh, visiting my grandparents there and being part of Taller, uh, Taller de Popular de Grafica in, in Mexico uh, through my mother. So I was, I had a very rich kind of situation, even though on other levels socially with my family life was kind of like crazy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so that helped me a lot for my formation. And when I decided to go to, um, even though I started painting when I was 10, I was taking classes at the University of Puerto Rico with Orta, you know, there was there was a couple of people that gave classes over there, so I started doing painting. Even though with my dad I learned how to do uh, graphics, I learned how to do engravings and stuff like that when I was a kid. And also I was part of Ballet de San Juan, which I was happy to see Alma today here, you know, with Ana Garcia, Hilda Navarra, so I was part of all that thing, you know. And also looking at René Marquez, and Pedro Juan Soto, you know, like, uh, in, I don't know if you remember, the, there was a bar called Bar, bar Seda, and uh, he used to go and write most of his books there. He used to put La Bellonera. He used to love to listen to uh, boleros. And I used to go sit over there and play, and he used to buy me a uh, jugo de guayaba, you know, que, que tu quieres, tu sabes? And then he would sit down and write sole trunco, you know what I mean? And then you would ask him, what are you doing? And then he would read a passage to you or something like that. Then Pedro Juan Soto was the same thing, you know, Emilio Diaz Barcarcel, I have a few crazy situation. One time when I was 15, I told Emilio, I was waiting, he says, Emilio, let me drive your car. I, I got a license and I drove a car. It was crazy because I didn't know how to drive the car. And I was driving in all San Juan through Calle Sol and all of that. So, you know, I had a very relationship with all these people and they sort of like gave me a sense, you know, uh, and, and liberty also to, to speak and to decide what I wanted to do. So it, I was very fortunate in that sense. Then later on, I decided to go to school in the States, and then I went to Mexico with my mother, who was um, very strong and in the fact, you know, listen, Nitsa, you're a woman. If you ever get married, don't let the men take over you. Remember, you have a career. You got to really work and do your career. Don't forget that. Have your children. Let them take care of the children, too. So I was very much informed to be liberated in that, in that sense through my dear mother. So she took me to Mexico and I started studying uh, painting and drawing and sculpture and all of that. And then I had, even though I had met Alfaro Siqueiros in Puerto Rico with my father, when he did the mural de Prometeo in the University of Puerto Rico, I had a chance to meet with him again in Mexico, in Cuernavaca, when he was doing the mural of De La Humanidad. It's a huge, big, big mural, which is really fantastic. And I saw his maquettes and stuff like that, and I was like so inspired that that's what I wanted to do, but I didn't know where to start, how am I gonna do that? Because this is like a master, a big guy, you know, where do you go, where, you know, what do you do? And the politics of it, and then also the fact that he had been in jail and he lost a lot of time in jail. He says, you know, well, you know, that's not the road, the way to go. You gotta empower yourself, and if you're gonna do something in terms of politics or something, you should do it through the work. Otherwise, it takes you away. Mm -hmm. uh, things like that, being incarcerated, you know, getting, you know, certain things. So it was really very exciting for me to have had that period in Mexico. Then when I came to uh, the States again, uh, I encountered my dad was with Tayel, it was called Real Great Society in El Barrio, uh, which is, was a group of architects and a group of um, architects and, and painters. Carlos Osorio was yes. also there. Yes. And Carlos, uh, I had known since I was a kid from Puerto Rico, and many times when we had traveled here, he was with my father, we would go to the Met 
to see some of the paintings. So I used to go with them also to the Mera, stuff like that. So uh, Manuel Otero, who was one of the architects, was the first one who came to me because I just finished coming back from Mexico and I came with these ideas of painting murals, you know, and you had the, the, you had, uh, the Chicago mural group, you know, Bill Walker, all these people in Chicago doing murals and who had been also in Mexico. They went to study with some of the uh, artists over there. And they were doing murals in Chicago, in Los Angeles. That was like a big thing in the United States of the Mexican influence during the 60s about communicating and doing this large, big uh, expression of the people and what's happening, the social justice uh, through muralism and also through the graphics. So I got involved in a taller, and uh, during that time it was Marcos, Adrian, and a couple of guys. And we were right across from the Young Lords during that time. So we used to do a lot of the posters for the Young Lords. Um, we also picked up a lot of garbage in the street when they used to burn us protests and stuff like that. And we would do an exhibit. At that time when we started, we were squatting on one building across the way which had no heat. And well, some, somehow people were surprised how we used to go there every day and we used to work. And Pedro Pietri was also part of that because they had been, they were the ones within your Lord to take over the church in 110th Street with the New Rican poets movement and all of that. So uh, many times we were raided by the CIA or the FBI or something because every time the floors would have been, they would have been taken off or something, like they were looking for arms. And Carlos used to be the one who used to walk in and say, well, they can come in here. All they're going to find is that there's only souls here, almas. Aquí lo que hay es alma boricua. <laughs> so that's where you got El Taller Boricua coming up to saying that este, El Taller es el alma boricua, no es armas. <laughs> and uh, then we started doing portfolios and all of that. Then finally we moved from there to, to Fifth Avenue and then we moved to... Um, no, we moved to, to Madison Avenue, and then from Madison, we went to the Hector Building, and then we started moving El Museo to go over to the Hector, Hector Building, trying to create that coalition and all of that. So out of all of that uh, mixing, I always wanted to create uh, some murals. I'm gonna start showing some visuals. And I started doing painted murals, but then I wanted to do them more, how would I say, uh, more permanent. So I thought that mosaic was kind of very expensive and I wanted to be something that it would be, something that it would be more, how would I say, um, that I could use my hand and make it more plasticy, you know, like that it could have movement and stuff like that. So I started using clay um, as a means because of the weather uh, and because it retains the color because of the sun. So I started experimenting, doing all kinds of experimentations with that. So anyway, so I started experimenting with that, you know, uh, about how was I going to do, aside from using the, 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 the themes, no tag, no tag, no So you can't, I mean, um, how would I say this? You are what you are because where you were born and your parents were born. And, okay, here I just start with my So here I am, an artist. So I, this is how I was gonna start my presentation. Um, I will be reaching the early retirement age of 62, and it's this month that I am supposed to fight for social security. <laughs> Looking back at my life as an artist, woman, daughter, sister, mother, wife, educator, mentor, and resident civil union partner, I have to admit two things. One, I refuse to grow up. 
Two, I have really been around the block. <laughs> One thing that was not mentioned in my bio is that I was a Condado Beach surfer and I have, and I have my legs to show it. <laughs> Growing up in Puerto Rico after the establishment of the Estado Libre Asociado, ELA, there was an influence of the rock and roll. So I listened a lot to Chuck Berry, Elvis Presley, The Beatles, Rolling Stones, and then later Los Pleneros, eh, Trio Los Panchos, Sandro, Rafael, and El Gran Combo, Johnny Ventura from Santo Domingo. Being a New York and New York now, I am remembering my favorite surfer song from the Beach Boys, I Get Around. <laughs> I can say with the first slide, I have come full circle as an artist, artist activist, and scholar. Art certainly has been in the center of my life during the good times and the hard times. Yes, I have blessed to have had the rich experience, bittersweet or extremely fulfilling. I want to present some thoughts to you and have conversations concerning what it means to be an artist, visual or written, and try to make a difference in New York and leave some kind of imprint of your craft. Next slide. What is, what is Puerto Rican art? And is it a difference from New York and art? Is one inclusive of the other, or is it exclusive, interchangeable? If traveling to another continent, is Puerto Rican art considered the same as New York and art? How does the artist transition from the patria versus diaspora? How does the artist move from becoming a Puerto Rican artist to a New York and artist? Is it possible? The answer is honoring our traditions, wherever we are, however we identify. This is a view of a detail from Neil Boring King, my mural at 103rd Street Station on the number six. I developed this technique. This is a linoleum print. So actually, from a linoleum print, I started deciding that I could make large pieces of linoleum, like a, let's say a three feet, five feet, four feet uh, linoleum uh, carved and, and print that into ceramics and create the mural. The reason why I do that is because this way it will have very fine details. So when you pass your hand on top of it after it's glaze and fire, you will understand what I'm talking about. So this is more, I started investigating more the technique of, you know, uh, the clay not, uh, you know, drying, the process of drying, the process of firing and stuff like that, so that I could achieve this. So, next slide. I draw the image and then cut images on linoleum plates. Now I work on the clay. Then I imprint the image in the clay and set up a ceramic process. This is glazing and then fire one of the pieces of the mural for the third street. Next slide, right? This is the detail of the glaze and the clay. This is a mural that I did for the Third Street Music School uh, for the courtyard, which is called Taino Symphony. And it's sort of the same process. This is a piece that I did for Grofner House for, and I worked it with a daycare center where I thought that it would be appropriate to have Raggedy Ann and Andy along the side with our black dolls because a lot of the kids that go to the school, their parents, like my grandmother, used to make black dolls for me and they were sort of like protections. And now they, you know, they call it voodoo dolls or whatever, so I wanted to change the whole scene. So this is called Oban Joko, which means El Rey Centavo, and it's in the library. Uh, next slide. This is another detail of one that I did for the hospital, for the pediatric ward at the Tropolitan Hospital, which is, uh, you see the clay and then the glaze part. And this is the, uh, the hanging of the tiles 
One side is the daytime and the other side is nighttime. Uh, next one. Yeah, go ahead, next slide. Uh, a determination to honor, honor your heritage will facilitate the shifting roles of an artist. Next one. As a scholar, social responsibility as an educator and mentor challenge obstacles, the continuity of, continuity of tradition, value of publishing, the artist as curator, impact of the new role in sales and global market. In other words, these are different things that you have to do uh, to, to really get ahead and to also continue working uh, socially. Next slide. There's a social responsibility as an educator and mentor. Embrace the challenges and the obstacles. Overcoming them allows the continuity of the tradition. Start thinking about the importance of publishing makes those contact with the art historians who may want to write about your work. Not for your ego's sake. How else will anyone know about your life's work? Thank you, Dr. Yasmin Ramirez. Thank you, Carmen Dolores Hernandez. Put aside that ego and identify that emerging artist who has needs to exhibit. Open up your heart and wealth of knowledge and experience understand you must also become a curator. This new role will not only help your own work to be sold in global market, but you will be also be able to promote emerging artists to sell. Social responsibility as an educator means that you have an academic responsibility to teach at a higher level. So this is the other project that I did for the 86th Street. Um, with this project, what I did is I sort of turned it around that uh, this population where the young people needed really help with getting their high school diploma and really sort of setting up their lives and, learn, and teaching them how to, to empower them. So I hired them to work with me and I paid them uh, by the hour and I created a whole program so that, so that they could work on the station with me on the 86th Street. So after 20 years of this project being up, I get a call from the editor from the New York Times who happened to be taking the, the train station that day and who looked in the wall and say, what is this? How long has this been here? And he was so surprised that he started to doing, doing a story and started, starting to look where are the people now, how old they are, what are their lives are like after 20 years. So this is the impact that we as artists have uh, in our community depending on how we develop our skills and techniques and how we can embrace the community to really turn situations around and make it positive. From the negative you could turn it into a positive situation and teach society that there is a way to really resolve all these problems. And I think artists a lot of the time because of the, they think out of the box. Sometimes they do have the answer for a lot of stuff. You know, that's how I came into Hunter College and I did my master in urban planning and urban affairs. And they pay for everything. You know, they even gave me a stipend. They pay for everything because they really wanted an artist to come in. And usually artists don't go for those masters because you know you always go in there and you're the ones that's challenging them. I don't think in percents. I think in colors. <laughs> so it becomes very challenging. So this is from the, some of the students did that. Then this is another one that I was invited as an artist in residence and I took the opportunity up in Connecticut to really change the, uh, in the fine arts department, their head over what they really wanted to do. Uh, they just were thinking, oh, you just come here and make a mural. I said, no, 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 I just don't come here and make a mural. I come here and we establish a program where you teach within the arts department, you know, about muralism and how to work with commissions because a lot of the students, when they are in these programs, they go out there and they become artists and they, that's it. What am I going to do? Where, you know, how do I get a commission? How do I write a proposal? How do I work with a lawyer? How do I make a presentation? 
you know, those type of things, they don't, they don't teach it to you. So this was one way for me to get in there and change their head, and I did. They're still running a program to this day, which is muralism. And I got the hospital for special care to give me one of their walls and pay the, the materials and everything to do this beautiful uh, mural, which is called Patience. It's a, it's a holistic piece because most of the people that live in this hospital uh, live there. You know, they're either born with some kind, you know, abnormal, whatever. So we used it and we worked with the students for two or three years, it took us to really do this. And it's a ceramic piece. Go ahead. And this is it's supposed to be like a circle, is this is, is the all the seasons. Uh, the whole purpose is they bring their patients out there, their families, they can look at it. Uh, it's a beautiful landscape uh, and it, it means a lot to the, to the people that are, live there and that come to visit. But it, we did a lot of research. So a lot of the public art also that I do, sometimes it requires that um, I try to engage the, either the people or the community that are going to live or live around the space. So it's not only my whim of this is what I really want to do, it's more what comes out of the whole core in terms of uh, the theme and whatever is going to happen there. And then eventually it will transcend, but it, it's a lot of work. So, so as an activist, keep on fighting out there, you know, until the day we die, we're just going to keep on fighting and doing things and try to understand um, What's happening, you know, establish dialogue, please, very important. Dialogue is the key. Working collectively is the key. You know, uh, forget about you being so important. Try to listen to the other guy. And you'll see the, the things that you'll be able to accomplish and, and really do in terms of the artwork and the community and all of that. You know, go with your heart. And that's it. And then it's really surprising. I got a call from this woman in Philadelphia. Uh, what is it? What, is, what are they called? Community? The Women's Community Women's Community Re Revalidation Program or Project Housing. They do housing. They have many, many uh, set of little settlements around Philadelphia where they create these houses for women who have children, don't have a place where to live. They make very little money, and they would like to live in a nice space, but they cannot afford it. So they make these housings for them. They're sort of like little townhouses that have two or three floors with a yard. You know, they even have laundry, laundry machine, all of that. So one day I get a call. You know, I said, I thought you want to buy a piece. You know, I thought that oh, I'm going to be able. To to sell something, you know what I mean? And no, we are making this big complex and we want to name it after you. We want to call it the Nixa Tufino townhouses. So I was like, wow, isn't that incredible? I never visited the place. I don't know where it is, you know what I mean? Now I have a place where to go, you know? So immediately I went and I traveled over there. I met some of their clients and I was so inspired by what they were doing and how many other uh, places they, they have, they like they have like a 137 units. And I said, yeah, use my name. And I said, matter of fact, let me see the architect plans. I'm doing a mural for them. You know what I'm saying? And they were go, wow, okay, so I'm doing a mural for them. So I'll invite you to the, to the, to the opening. So I, I want to end with uh, me, my mentor, Dr. Daisaku, Daisaku Ikeda. Art is the cry of the soul for the core of one's being. Creating and appreciating art set free the joy of soul, trapped within us. That is why art causes such a joy. Art, quite aside from any question of skill or its lack, it is the emotion, the pleasure of expressing one's life exactly as it is. Those who see such art see are moved by its passion, its strength, its intensity, and its beauty. That is why it is impossible to separate, separate fully human life from art. Thank you. Um, I think we don't have much time for the questions, right? I'm sure there are a lot of questions. I just want to say to sum up this a little bit is that uh, what these three wonderful women have said kind of um, 
tells us that these three Puerto Rican women were not strangers in a strange land. They were stimulated and empowered by the Puerto Rican community, which gave them the strength and the knowledge to become the artists they have become, and thus to change the city in order to accept what Puerto Rican spirit can do, much more than any politician could have. So thank you all of you for coming here.